Ой, пане посол, сьогодні у нас унікальна можливість. Я зразу вас закликаю, дорогі студенти, без протоколу, тому що мені зробив пан посол зауваження, що забагато такого дипломатичного протокола. Він каже, я хочу просто поспілкуватися. Тому зразу вас закликаю до відкритості, до щирості, задавайте будь-які питання, які ви хотіли. Лабдіян, Стоямес, Юксквейт, Рептум, Українас, Націоналая, Університета. Дякую. Шановні, дорогі студенти, шановний пане посол, я маю за честь вам Шановні колеги, представити надзвичайного та повноважного посла Латвійської Республіки в Україні Юріса Пойкансо. Я дуже радий, що пан посол знайшов час, щоб відвідати наш університет і зустрітися із студентством. Його була основна вимога, його був сланг «Я хочу почути молодь України». Тому... Пане посол, вам слово. Будь ласка. Так. Дякую. Я дуже радий сьогодні з вами зустрітися. Я вибачаю, що буду говорити англійською мовою, але якщо будуть запитання українською мовою, я зможу відповісти. Тому що я хотів би сказати декілька слів. Я трошки боюся, що я не зможу це зробити українською мовою. Дякую, друзі. Я дуже радий бути в Юніверсії сьогодні. And uh, share, I would say, I don't want to deliver a lecture, but I would like to share my thoughts where Latvia and Ukraine currently are in the geopolitical map of Europe. I have huge appreciation for what your country is doing in resisting aggression from the East. I think the key question Ukraine is struggling is to be an independent country, to live according to your wishes, your traditions, like you want to live. The Baltic states are being challenged also by challenge from the East, but in comparison with you, I think from Russia's point of view, the Baltic states have always been a bit different in their understanding. President Putin and his entourage really believes that Russia, Russians, Ukrainians and the Russians are one nation. This is the key driving force why he wants to undermine the Ukrainian independence. I think he understands that the western part of Ukraine is different, but when it comes to Kyiv, Odessa, Kharkiv, Zaporizhia, other cities in the eastern part of Ukraine, he truly believes that Ukraine is a part of so-called Ruski Mir. And if you look at Ruski Mir, what has been created in Donetsk and Lugansk, we see uh, what kind of problems are being brought actually to this part of Ukraine. So your key task for Ukraine remains is to remain independent, to remain strong. You have plenty of problems inside Ukraine. Ukraine is very different. We spoke with the rector. You have the western part of Ukraine, Ternopil, Ivano Frankivsk, Lviv. Those regions who were strongly in favor of independence at the beginning of the 90s. But you have other parts of Ukraine who think in a different way, unfortunately. So, and if you look at the last results of regional elections in October last year, you can see that, for example, Opposition of Platforma Zazhitya, they can obtain a lot of votes in the eastern regions of Ukraine. Not in Ternopil, obviously, not in Lviv, but in other parts. So people think in a different way. Uh, you had recently a parliamentarian elected in the parliament of Ukraine, allegedly with having a Russian passport. So, the country in its intentions, ideas, is divided. Uh, the second is Ukraine, like Latvia, lacks statehood traditions. And statehood traditions are 
they are both not used to be independent. Historically, you have been pushed strongly from the West, from the Poles, Catholics, in Latvia this is from Germans, and from the East from Russians. So as a result, the Ukrainian independence today is only 30 years, like in Latvia. As a result, it's uh, extremely difficult to manage and govern the country because you expect or evade some instructions or orders or advices coming from some kind of capital. If you look at the geopolitical opponent of Ukraine, Russia, Russia is a very strong country with very strong statehood traditions. So this is an extremely serious problem. So besides, as I was saying, Ukraine being divided with weak statehood traditions, it's a serious problem. The third issue, what from my point of view is important for Ukraine, it's uh, we are all coming from the Soviet system. This difficult heritage. But in, in Ukraine, this heritage has been much more difficult, let's say, in the Baltic states and in Michigan countries. Corruption, oligarchy, all these factors hinder the development of Ukraine. So, we are in a difficult situation, I mean, when it comes to Ukraine, but there is definitely light at the end of the tunnel. At first, uh, I think the biggest success of 2014, you were able to survive. You lost the Crimea temporarily, you lost Donbas, I believe also temporarily, but the border today, the administrative border you have, it's much farther to the east than many would have expected. I think many people in Moscow and other places were expecting that Kharkov will, would, would fall, Odessa would fall, so you were, were able to survive. I'm meeting a lot of Ukrainians who are saying, I changed my mind since 2014. I was thinking we are part of the same Russian world, but now I'm feeling as a Ukrainian. So Ukrainian national identity has been strengthened, and this is very important. Maybe for Internopin, you had it already at the beginning of the 90s, but for many people in the Parisian Kharkiv, this might be some kind of a new revelation. And uh, I think it's very important that your interest in joining the European Union and NATO has been put into the Constitution of Ukraine as a national priority. We did it in 1995. Okay, we didn't put it in the Constitution, but we signed the political declaration. You did it just a couple of years ago. This is the difference 24, 25 years. From my point of view, Ukraine cannot remain neutral. Either you are a part of the Eurasian Economic Soyuz, or you are a part of the European Union. Neutrality in general in Europe nowadays, it's a very big exception. You have Switzerland, where you have historical neutrality. You have Sweden having neutrality since the beginning of the 19th century. You might be having neutrality like Finland and Austria signed in accordance with international agreements. But even in case of Finland, Austria and Sweden, these are all parts of the European Union. So my conviction is that Ukraine doesn't have any other option but to join the European Union and NATO one day, because maybe you are much bigger than Sweden or Finland, but having such a geopolitical opponent as Russia, you don't have any other option. In addition, uh, looking at the infrastructure of Ukraine, the western part of Ukraine, I see what the European Union has brought to Latvia. Because many people believe this is just a political project. Poland receives during seven years, which is like 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 budgetary period of the European Union, around 80 billion euros in general for the development of their own country. So the European Union is not only about politics; it's only about economic. It's also about economic development, and this is something where Ukraine can gain a lot. We might be critical of the European Union, but at, at the end of the day, this is the Union which is based on voluntary basis. In theory, we are all equal, 
both Germany and Latvia have one vote. Obviously, in the European Parliament, it's a bit different. You have more parliamentarians for Germany, more for France, less for Latvia. But the European Union doesn't impose any principles on your national identity, on your national language, on your religion. So it's a freedom of choice. We have Orthodox countries in the European Union, we have Catholic countries, Protestant countries, but united by the joint vision of Europe. So from my point of view, there is no other choice. I think the western part of Ukraine, and this is coming back to my previous point, has a special responsibility for the future of Ukraine. Why? You are a part of the Austro-Hungarian, Polish, Ukrainian cultural heritage. You know what Europe means, what, does it, what kind of importance it has. Many parts of Ukraine have not had this opportunity to be so close to Europe like you have been. We yesterday spoke with the Rector, I believe probably it's extremely difficult for a Western Ukrainian to become the President of Ukraine, because usually people would vote for someone from the let's say, your own region. So from my point of view, this is always representative of central part of Ukraine, uh, who is not like divisive in the east or the west. But I think having your historical experience, having your cultural links with Europe, you are much better suited in integrating in Europe than other parts of Ukraine. This is your special responsibility. I can absolutely understand there are different national heroes in the western part of Ukraine in comparison with the rest of Ukraine. I don't have a good reply here. Bandera, Shukhevich are perceived differently in the western part of Ukraine, in the eastern part of Ukraine. Matthias Lengis, these historical personalities should never become a divisive issue for the country of Ukraine. I think heroes should be respected. If Bandera is popular in Lviv, in Ternopil, he should be respected here. If he is not popular in Kharkiv, in Dnipro, there are no ways to impose these historical personalities. It's more as a question about creating a national Ukrainian identity which is suitable for everyone. I don't see any serious problems here. But being representatives from Ternopil, from the western part of Ukraine, from my point of view, it's very important to take into account feelings of other people living in the rest of the territory of Ukraine. So all in all, being in Lviv and being in Ternopil, having a walk today and this morning, I don't see a big difference between Latvia and Ukraine. Yes, we have maybe more money from the EU, more support from the EU, but otherwise we are very similar. But you have this historical task and mission to bring these values gradually to the rest part of, you, of Ukraine. To make Ukraine more European, having Ukraine a more European identity, keeping in mind the Kolodomor actually ruined lives of millions of Ukrainians in Donbass 100 years ago. You have people in Ukraine and Sri Lanka. Today, it's, it's much more difficult to find it. So, you were able to keep your Ukrainian identity here. So, this is your task, uh, how, to, how, to, how to keep it uh, for the rest of Ukraine. And the last. And nowadays, we have a lot of discussions. Many Ukrainians are asking why we are not a member of the European Union, why we are not a member of NATO. These are very relevant and legitimate questions. But, please, never give up. Fifteen years ago, when we were on the path of becoming a member of the European Union, many Europeans were telling, you might become a member of the European Union, but not a member of NATO. So we face the same situation. Europe is not closing doors to you. If even you don't get a clear European perspective nowadays, it doesn't mean that the door is closed. But you must be working very hard and never lose your hope. I'm absolutely sure 
that in our lifetime we will see Ukraine becoming at least member of the European Union. NATO is a bit different question. But both European Union, I believe in Ukraine, which is a part of United Europe. So even if you don't get these clear signals now, it doesn't mean that you don't have these signals, you don't uh, have this perspective. I'm absolutely sure that Lisbon Agreement, Article 49, clearly states any European state can join the European Union. So never lose hope. All the best to you, and I will be very happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. To je to ukrajinsko. Našenalni pane posol, šanovni druzi. Juris Poikans sedni pokazal sem nam predlog. Jakim činom ljudina diplomatično rivnja vilno vladije ukrajinskoj mojo i vilno vladije istorije naše države. Spilokujući z nim, ja vidiu naskike glaboko vin znaje i ukrajinsku dobu kozasta i ukrajinsku dobu ukrajinskoj narodovi Respublike 1917. rik i vtračeni šans dle Ukrajine. No rik i bitkode do razumenja našoho nacionalizmu i patriotizmu. Čim mi smo spilni krajine Ukrajina i krajine Baltike i zakrama Latvije. Dorim studenti, ja zaraz vrtaju se do vas. U vas unikalna možnost. Zaraz zadati pitanja i s prvih ust z ust diplomatičnoho predsjednika družnije nam krajine Latvije, počuti same te, što vas ti kazi. Ja zaprošu ju do diskusije. Бачите, ми спеціальні піджаки зняли для того, щоб ближче бути до вас. Це найважливіше, тому що читати лекцію – це не цікаво. Я хотів би почути ваше враження, які питання у вас є. Так. Хто бажає задати питання? Будь ласка. А зараз покажіть, як вас звати. Привіт. Я студентка другого курсу. У мене таке питання. Латвія, як і Україна, як але Латвія зараз має розвинену економіку, країна займає високі місця в індексах громадських свобод, в демократичних управліннях, від членом ЄС, НАТО і не тільки. В яких сферах, в першу чергу, потрібні зміни в Україні для досягнення такого результату? Ми маємо свої проблеми. Давайте сказати, ми не ideal country at this moment, but I think what helped us? The question you should answer yourselves is who you are. We, at the beginning of 90s, were knowing we are Latvians, we want to safeguard our independence, that's why in 1995 we decided we are moving towards European Union and NATO. In Ukraine, I think the key challenge is still is, many people are saying, this is corruption, this is justice system. But I think the key issue is understanding that you are Ukrainians and you are a part of the European family. That you are not uh, Malorossi or, let's say, one, one nation with Russians. I think this is what helped us, is understanding your historical mission. Obviously in Ternopil, I don't have any doubts. You understand who you are. But, as I was telling, I think your mission is to bring also this feeling of ukraine also to other parts. So, from my point of view, it's the creation of a nation-state, which is in the process now in Ukraine, it's a key task. Not fighting corruption or anything else, because uh, this is very important. But, from my point of view, when the whole nation will be able to say that we are moving towards European Union, I think this is the biggest success. This is what we did at the beginning of the 90s. At the end of the 80s of the last century, we were, when we were fighting for independence, we were gathering third of the nation on, let's say, national rallies for independence. In your case, yes, Lviv, Ivano Frankivsk, Ternopil probably were in the lead. But you are just a part of Ukraine, maybe a small part of Ukraine. So, from my point of view, in 2014, what happened? You lost temporarily your territories, but for many Ukrainians they obtain this sense of belonging to the Ukrainian nation. So this is the key. You must keep building your own state. Because I was, as I was telling, 
you are facing challenges coming from the west, having a very strong Polish identity, from the east the Russian identity, this is the creation of the Ukrainian state and strengthening of the Ukrainian nation from my point of view, which is the most important task. If you will be able to do it, you will be able also to fight other problems, which is oligarchs or, let's say, corruption, things like that. Very good. Who wants to ask? Who wants to ask? Who wants to ask? Hi, my name is Tanya. I'm a freshman. So, uh, in our country, we have a lot of uh, discussion about question of language. And uh, I want to ask, uh, I know that uh, after the collapse of the resource, most people gained Latvian citizen, citizenship due to naturalization through uh, knowledge of the language. Meanwhile, in Ukraine, the, there have never been any special conditions under which people could get a citizenship. In your opinion, how does the language issue affect uh, the unity of the Ukrainians and what do you need for better unity and mutual understanding and how it influences language issue uh, on different, uh, uh, on different um, questions of our country? Thank you. It's, it's, it's a very good question. And, and, and you know, it's quite interesting when, uh, when I'm being asked in some TV or radio discussions concerning the role of the Ukrainian language, it, I always feel that there is a Latvian experience, there is a Hungarian experience, there is a Ukrainian experience. Ukraine is actually a bilingual country. People can speak both languages easily. In the East, let's say, the education system maybe is transferred to Ukrainian, but during breaks, kids are speaking in Russian at the end of the day. I cannot provide any advice if, let's say, I would speak as a Latvian Latvian, I would say the key role is strengthening the Ukrainian language in every possible direction, which is actually happening in Ternopil, Rivne, uh, Lviv. But then, at the end of the day, it's a very big question how we define the Ukrainian patriot. Is a lack of Ukrainian patriot. I think yes, but he speaks Russian. He said Kharkiv, for example, from the Ruski Mir. So my reply to that is, given these historical differences, linguistic differences, I would opt for strengthening of the Ukrainian state, the Ukrainian identity, but not necessarily meaning the Ukrainian language. Why? I think it would be quite naive to think that in Odessa and Kharkiv people would speak Ukrainian even in 10 years period. It's not going to happen. But the Ukrainian state has legitimate rights to strengthen the role of the Ukrainian language, obviously, politically, economically, linguistically. But I think rights of all people should be respected. One thing that I always hear that the Russians are complaining that... Uh, the role of the Russian language is undermined in Ukraine. If it's true, why is there are no protests in Kharkiv for this and Dnipro where people will be going out with banners and saying that we are feeling oppressed? It's a very simple answer. People living in these parts of Ukraine understand it's beneficial for their kids to learn Ukrainian, to study Ukrainian. Even in your political leadership, I know, very often the native language is Russian, but people would speak Ukrainian officially and in, not, in some other events. So, from my point of view, the Ukrainian language shouldn't be imposed. But believe me, with the Ukrainian state becoming stronger, the role of the Ukrainian language will grow. It's absolute, absolute reality. I was in Rivne a month ago, and I was asking people in which language you spoke in the Soviet times. They said 50-50 in general, in Rivne. What about now? It's 90 Ukrainian, 10 in Russia. Say, okay. So, so. so this is how the Ukrainian state has transformed, let's say, this uh, dimension. So, as I, as I was telling, it's extremely difficult to provide any good answers or any good advice. 
But if I were Ukrainian, I would try to embrace all people of the country without specifying which language they are talking. The key issue is, sorry, people are dying in the east of Ukraine very often, being there, being predominantly very often Russian-speaking people. So they are giving their lives for the sake of Ukraine. And at the same time, as I was saying, in Lviv and Ternopil, it's a different situation. Not the language. No historical personality should become a divisive issue. This is from my point of view. That's why when many Western colleagues are asking why Ukrainians are praising Bandera, I'm always telling them, I, I'm not the person who is going to impose national heroes on any part of the Ukrainian society. If Bandera is a hero in Ternopil, in Ivan Frankivsk, I'm not going to raise any concerns about that. So, from my point of view, in this specific historical period, the key question is about strengthening Ukrainian statehood. Ukrainian language, Ukrainska mova, it will come anyway, it will follow the development of the Ukrainian state. Thank you, Anna. Tobaraya, would last come on, sir? Uh, I think the key issue what we see is we understand this injustice Ukraine suffered in 2014 when your neighbor, our neighbor took a part of a territory of a different country. International law is extremely important for countries like Latvia and Ukraine. Why? If you return let's say, to the situation where no international law will prevail, we will end up as in the Second World War, when countries are occupied, disappearing. So international law is extremely important. This is the first that I see we should support, and we are supporting, the territorial integrity and sovereignty of the Ukrainian state. This is in Latvia's national interest. Thank you. Uh, in the international arena, what we are doing, um, you know, it's very often, what can Latvia do bilaterally? Very little. Yes, we support Ukraine, we have visits, our president will come to the opening of the Crimean platform, but what we can really do, it's influence decision-making in European structures and uh, in Euro-Atlantic, for example, parliamentary structures. Let's say we have a special Crimea support group in NATO Parliamentary Assembly. One of the creators of this Crimean platform group is a Latvian parliamentarian. Uh, Council of Europe, we are cooperating in the Parliamentary Assembly really a lot. So I think the key task of the Latvian diplomacy is not only develop bilateral ties with Ukraine, but support Ukraine in the international organizations where you don't have access. For example, in Brussels, European Union. We have annual, not annual, monthly meetings of foreign ministers of the European Union. Obviously, our foreign minister will speak about Ukraine. So he will speak in the presence of French, German, Portuguese foreign ministers. It doesn't mean they will change their mind immediately, but we have this platform where we can raise those issues which are important for you. So the key task, I think, for our diplomacy is to support Ukraine in the international arena. And I think we are we have reached a very good level of cooperation on that. Thank you. Okay. Please. Uh, my greeting is to you, uh, dear future ambassador. My name is Victoria. I'm a fourth year student of international law. And uh, my question is about fear. Zemun uh, Crane said that the fear is the one of the things that can rule the person. And my question is, um, do you think the fear is the efficient way to overcome some problems in Ukraine? Do you think that the person should um, be scared to break the law, to um, commit some crimes, to, um, to make our country better in, in that way? So what is your position? Uh, this theory, I would say. Thank you. <laughs>
The rule of law, from my point of view, is the key task Ukrainians and Latvians are striving for. And I think the key obstacle for the development of Ukraine is the lack of justice, from my point of view. My feeling is that uh, what Ukraine is lacking sometimes, I get the feeling, you are lacking uh, modern Ataturk, like in the Turkish nation, in a way. Mm. The person who transferred the country. Obviously, his heritage now is being challenged in Turkey, in other parts, but um, if breaking the law serves some farther ultimate aim, let's say justice, uh, sorry to say, maybe it, it's very non-diplomatic, I think it's we should be trying to do that. I think at the end of the day is uh, without having the rule of law, Ukrainians will be losing faith in their country. This is number one, which will be very bad for the future of your country. So, looking at the President Zelensky, I truly believe, maybe not having experience when he became the president. I think he truly wants to transform the country. Whether he is successful or not, it's a different question. But from my point of view, it's uh, you should have a real break with the past. And if this is done politically, sometimes at the expense of the rule of law, sorry to say, I might be supportive to that mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Наши иностранные студенты. Абсолютно. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Fitz, a second year student of international relations. I would like to ask if there is any relationship between Latvia and Africa, and in particular my country, Rwanda, and if there is any what's the contribution of Latvia to the development of African countries. Thank you. Sorry, from which country you are? Rwanda. Rwanda. I would say we are making first steps in the direction of Africa. Latvia is the country. We don't have any historical ties and relations. In the 17th century, there was the Duchy of Kurland, which occupied the current part of Latvia. We had a small colony in the country of Gambia. But let's say, unlike French, Brits, Germans, we don't have any historical traditions. We currently have only one embassy in the, on the African continent, which is not even really Africa, it's Egypt. It's a part of a wider Middle East. I know that our northern uh, neighbors, Estonians, are opening an embassy in Kenya, which from my point of view is a very, I would say, bold move. We know very little, and we don't have any African embassy, by the way, in Riga currently. Here in Kiev, by the way, not so many. South Africa, Nigeria, Egypt, okay, Arab countries, quite many, but let's say if you go sub-Saharan Africa, really just a couple of embassies, only big states. So, this is something where we have not invested a lot, and, 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 and we are lacking knowledge. We strive to become a non-permanent member of the United Nations Security Council for the years of 2025. And by the way, in the United Nations Security Council, it's actually Africa which is dominating a lot of issues there with water and things like that. So we will need to learn much, much more about Africa than we are doing now. We are obviously in a very disadvantaged position, even in comparison with Finland, Sweden, or Denmark, those countries which are providing a lot of development assistance. We are not doing that because we are not a rich country. So, um, at this moment, I would say so. Our foreign policy is developing, and I'm quite sure we will expand our presence in Africa, because without expansion of presence, we will never be able to understand in general what's going on there. This is a region which is always internationally a bit underestimated and, and, and not being considered as extremely uh, valuable, but from my point of view, this has always been a mistake. We should definitely invest in, in Africa and Europe being a part 
in a way very much of the same geopolitical area so we definitely like also Latvia I, I agree we should invest more in understanding and learning about your problems mm-hmm. cool. Hello, good morning, dear Ambassador. I am a senior, a first year student from relation, uh, international relations, and my question is about uh, the North uh, Stream, second North Stream. So it is, I think, it is one of the greatest aim of Russia and Europe. So what is the action steps uh, of your country and also with Ukraine together to prevent this? North Stream, North Stream is a serious problem. <laughs> I think not only for Ukraine or for the Baltics, it's a serious problem for the European Union. At first, it's never good when different EU member states perceive the issue differently. Let's say Germany and Latvia or Germany or Poland. My feeling is that North Stream will be completed at the end of the day. Actually, before the American sanctions, I would say the pipeline was completed of around 95%. So, at this moment, I get my own feeling that it will be completed. The Germans have always stated that they perceive it as an economic project. I believe even they understand this is not an economic project. Uh, from my point of view, It's very little what we can do at this moment. But uh, for the Ukrainian state, from my point of view, it's very important to think already at this moment what will it mean to be without Russian transit gas, for example. How to compensate these two or three billion euros which are every year pouring in the Ukrainian state budget. So you will need to think what kind of alternatives you have at the end of the day. But at this moment, from my point of view, yes, our political position, the Ukrainian political position, the Polish political positions are clear, but I don't believe that at this moment we can stop the project as such. So the aim of Russia is very simple. At first they want obviously bypass the territory of Ukraine. So, taking away these two or three billion euros, as I was saying. The second, uh, they want to tie Europe much closer, let's say, to their gas needs, specifically for Germany. From my point of view, it's a very much a political project because German, German, Germany's geopolitical position has always been trying to engage Russia. So I believe many politicians in Berlin believe that actually through the completion of the North North Stream, actually Germans will get some leverage over the Russian decision-making process. It might be true and might not be true at the same time. At this moment, the loser is obviously our part of the region. And I was, as I was saying, I don't think this is a good project for the future of our continent. It's not good at all. But regardless of that, We are anyway staying in the same positions like we were, let's say, five or seven years ago. When our politicians meet, we always agree, this is a bad project. But unfortunately, nothing changes on that. So I think Ukraine must be realistic what's going to happen and search for, for alternatives actually in this situation. Mm-hmm. Okay. Так, у нас так, там было то, что это. Ну, да. Так, вот они.
Uh, let's start with the second question. Something has happened in Minsk. It's extremely dangerous. The plane was close to the, let's say, air zone between Belarus and Lithuania and was reverted back to the airport of Minsk. The aim was very clear to arrest one of the founders of Nexta channel, obviously. Let's be realistic. There was, there was no threat. We don't know what was happening on the plane as such. But the key aim was to arrest uh, one of the opponents of Lukashenko's regime. And, and, and given that Lukashenko is 26 years the president, for him it was personally important. So Belarus is an extremely important country for all of us. It's a part of Grand Duchy of Lithuania, Pospolita, historical part. So we have, let's say, common Corinia, let's say. We are very much part of the same tree. And nowadays, for example, if you want to develop Latvian, Ukrainian transit relations, without Belarus, it's, it's impossible. Let's say, just imagine, Air Baltic flying from Riga to Kiev, if we bypass Belarus, we go through Poland, it's much more time, it's much more expensive. So Belarus is, uh, is, is something what is an uh, extremely important country. I think the fact what happened, uh, it's, we should absolutely, we should react somehow. Uh, allowing the government of Belarus, you never know so when you will be flying over the territory of Belarus, when you will be stopped or, let's say, pushed to, 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 to come to the ground. So this is something extraordinary even, even, even for, 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 for any type of international relations. So it should be absolutely condemned and some actions should be taken. Ukraine becoming a part of the European Union. I think there are two parts of this question. The first is political part. Germans, French, Dutch can say we are ready to welcome Ukraine tomorrow. Let's, let's assume, idealistically. Uh, so you need a political decision at first. The second, from my point of view, which is even more important, any country to be accepted as a member of the European Union should complete or should pass some kind of legislation and to implement it into practice. So, which means, if I were a Ukrainian, uh, I would never expect any political decision. Because I think sometimes I get the feeling that in Kyiv many people believe, if Germans and French would say, they would accept us, we would become a part of the European Union. It's true and not true at the same time. The key issue is about making reforms in the country, making here a European society. Let's say Finland and Sweden are not members of NATO, but if they would like to be members of NATO, they would be immediately accepted. Why? Because their standards are fully compatible with the principles of NATO. So you should try to build your country where Germans and French or Italians would say, we don't have any doubts, they are ready. If you are putting hopes that there will be a political decision, it might not come. So the question is about transforming your society, transforming your system, so you become a part of the European family. And as I was mentioning in my intervention speech, don't take it personally when, let's say, some governments in Europe are saying, no, Ukraine don't have a perspective. Don't do it. You have the perspective. But the question is about transforming the country. Why they don't see the perspective? Because they see you are an unreformed country. They see you have problems with justice. They pre see problems for foreign investors. So try to do everything. They don't have any arguments against you. And then this political decision will come. So this is a big discussion about Stulia Utra Milivichera. You remember that in Vinat Stulia uh, he wanted to buy the Stulia from Witsen and he was saying Sначала деньги, потом Stulia. And he was saying, давайте сначала Stulia, мы потом деньги. So at first you must deliver these chairs 
and then the rest. Дякуємо. Вечером гроші, зранку крісла. Зранку гроші, вечером крісло. Ну да, да. Дякуємо. Хто ще бажає? А там, там було плутання, по кофі там. Дякую. 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 Дякую.
try to identify your interests, which is your part of interest. Reading and learning is, is really the key. What I would advise is learning languages. Uh, we came from the so same Soviet system where, let's say, English language was taught on the level London is the capital of Great Britain, a cat dog, my name is Yuri, so it's a thing. Uh, and nowadays you cannot survive even without English, but you must, I would say, German, learning French. This is finding the way what is an interest for you. Polish is extremely important, obviously, for this part. But it's constant and regular learning, reading, books, newspapers, no other way. It's practice is important. But in any country you come, you start working, you must know something about the country itself. You must know something about the history. You must know what is uniting us, what is disuniting us. So, let's say Ukraine for a Latvian diplomat is a very easy country, in general. I imagine I will go to the Czech Republic, for example, maybe much less important country for us than Ukraine, but I, I, I would need to actually learn everything from the scratch in a way. So this is, this is a constant learning and this is something which must go through the lifetime. And nowadays I see that people in, in our times, let's say, we didn't have any WhatsApps or Facebooks or anything. We were reading books all the time. This is really maybe sounds very conservative, but there is nothing better than returning back to the traditional just reading. And, uh, and, and imagine that given the role of how the youth now perceives many things, you will get a lot of advantages. You can play games on the one hand, let's say, but if you are reading a book, so you will get anyway this advantage at the end of the day. So nothing changes. These modern technologies, in a way, yes, they provide a lot of opportunities. But at the end of the day, we return back that only znania, znania to znania. Nothing else. And by the way, Asian students, why they are very often better than European students? Because they want to get better results. They want to study more. They want to work harder. This is a serious problem for Europeans at the end of the day. Good evening, my name is Marta Stambert. I'm studying the fifth year of the tourism and I want to ask you about tourism in your country because Latvia is a very nice and wonderful uh, place for our tourists and tourists from other countries. And uh, I want uh, to ask you about what you think about uh, how uh, will be tourism uh, how will the tourism uh, develop in the future in your country under current uh, conditions? We depend on tourism, obviously, and, and, and the role of tourism is growing in my country more and more every year. Uh, at first, we are a part of the Baltic states, let's say people are coming to Tallinn, Riga, and Vilnius, so they don't come specifically for Riga, unlike Russians. For Russians, it's different. They want to go to Yurmala. Uh, or to Riga, for Ukrainians they can make a difference, but otherwise we are part of the same region. Uh, I would a bit reply differently saying that Ukraine is doing very little for the development of tourists, for example, unlike Latvia. Uh, I would say Lviv, yes, I can praise Sadovi, uh, the, uh, the, the, the local head of public administration, Lviv Oblast is investing quite a lot because probably you have even more unique historical and uh, nature objects than we have in Latvia, for example. If you look at Lviv, Ternopil, castles, mountains, mm -hmm. water, so many things which can be solved. Tourism is, is an important part of our economy, but uh, in Latvia, I would say, this is still Riga. People are largely going to the capital of Latvia. So, obviously, when COVID restrictions will be, I hope, uh, cancelled, so we will see again the return of tourists. Because for such cities like Riga, Tallinn, uh, it, it's extremely difficult to survive without a foreign tourist. In Ukraine, it's a bit different. 
in Kiev, people come from Dnipro, Zaporizhia, they stay for overnight, so hotels are booked, so people are in Latvia, this is not the case. We cannot survive without foreign tourists as such. So for us, the key issue is really uh, somehow to find this uh, right way between vaccination and collective immunity. Without that, uh, it will be extremely difficult. And, and Riga is, in general, it's a transit center of the Baltic states. So we always had more flights, we had more passengers. Uh, so it's in our interests. Моє питання буде стосуватися такої події, як відкриття початного консульства Латвійської Республіки в Слов'янці. Я хочу запитати, задати декілька питань. Які головні функції даного консульства в цьому регіоні? Чи, як на вашу думку, чи зможе це консульство стати центром співпраці України з Латвією? І наскільки ефективна діяльність початних консульств в даному регіоні? Дякую. Це дуже важливо. I hope it will become a center of cooperation between Latvia and Donetsk Oblast. Why we open the honorary consulate in Slavyansk? They understand how difficult it is to live in Donetsk Oblast and Lugansk Oblast. We understand. This so-called border we are having now, it's artificial border, it has never been in history. You have Gorlivka on one side, Toretsk on the other side. So this is a huge tragedy for the Ukrainian nation. But we understand it's important for the government of Ukraine to develop the territory which is under Ukraine direct control. Let's say Kromatorsk, Slavyansk, uh, Popasna, Severodonetsk. And uh, we saw the opening of this consulate as a political step. And I was telling during the opening, I would like to see this consulate to be transferred to Donetsk when it will come back as a part of Ukraine. So this is a temporary consulate. But this is there because currently Donetsk is under occupation. Second, uh, there is Latvian flag. So you can feel the presence of the European Union in Latvia. The third, we have aides to the honorary consulate who are staying there permanently where you can obtain information about Latvia economically, politically, in the field of education. And plus, what we will try, we will try to bring some exhibitions there, for example, uh, from Latvia, where people from Slavians can come and see about our achievements in the field of economy, about our history, culture, and arts. So, the Hungary Consulate in Slavians should become a focal point of cooperation between Latvia and Donetsk Oblast. So, this is very important. We have a Hungary Consulate in Lviv, the oldest one, more than 15 years. But we understand that politically, probably, Honorary Consulate in Slavyansk is more important than Honorary Consulate in Lviv. Because in Lviv, uh, in general, you, you don't have any, let's say, serious problems or challenges. Thank you, Ivan. Who should be a member? Good morning, my name is Adolfo uh, we are all, you know, we are all products of the same Soviet and socialist system. What is the difference between Latvia and Ukraine? We have the same problems, but in Ukraine they are much deeper. Believe me, in Slovakia, Poland, Hungary, the situation is also very difficult. If the country is poor, let's say, and I would say Latvia maybe is not a, and Ukraine are not poor countries globally, but on the European level we are not rich countries. So there will always be incentives for corruption. Let's say in Denmark, in Finland, the level of corruption is very, very, very low. So this is a question of welfare. And at the same time, if you don't fight the corruption, this welfare will never come as well. So you will have problems with that. So this is the heritage we are having. The difference, as I was saying, I had a very good friend, the deputy foreign minister of Moldova, and I was, I was once telling him the same. It's not such a huge difference between our countries. 
The problem is we are maybe smaller. We wanted to, and by the way, we understood, we want to be a part of the European Union. We understood if we don't fix the problem of corruption, at least in civilized levels, we are not going to be a member of the European Union. We received huge assistance from Denmark, Sweden, and Finland. So we had our advantages, but believe me, this is a real problem also for us. Yeah. Дорогі мої студенти, унікальність цього моменту в тому, наскільки щирими були відповіді Юріса Пойканса, надзвичайного повноважного посла дружної нам країни Латвії. Сьогодні ви побачили, а ще краще почули, наскільки є важливими саме комунікації між державами для того, щоб виробляти стратегічні намери двох держав і узгоджувати саме можливості жити в спільному європейському домі. Я сьогодні хочу вам подякувати, Юріс, від студентства, від професорського викладацького складу. Шкодуємо, що так є мало часу, шкодуємо, що пандемія вносить саме корективи і ми в умовах таких певних карантинних обмежень проводимо нашу зустріч, але я думаю, що та зустріч буде розміщена, питання будуть, які студенти здавали двало відповіді, обов'язково в Ютубі, на певних інформаційних каналах, і наші студенти зуміють ширше знайомитися з позицією країни Латвія, з позиції дипломатичного корпусу і з тими новими можливостями для України і, зокрема, для молоді. Молодь змінює світ. Я думаю, що сьогоднішня зустріч дає їм ще більше впевненості в тому, що потрібно працювати і потрібно, як сказав посол, оволодіти знаннями. Не бійтеся черпати нові знання для того, щоб реалізувати свої намери. Ми сьогодні маємо унікальну розвитку. Почувши ваші відповіді, почувши вашу доповідь, черпанути для себе наше новітнє бачення. І в знак сьогоднішньої зустрічі прийміть цей маленький знак уваги на університету. І я думаю, що тут є ті люди, які по-новому відкрили для себе країну Латвії. Адже щирість посла – це є щирість всього латвійського народу. Thank you. Good time. 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 Good time.